Hello everyone, this is Fernando from Moonspell and you're listening to What's Metal. So, uh, thanks for inviting me into your tour bus, uh, Fernando. It's, uh, it's a real pleasure and actually I'm getting a drink here as well, so <laughs> I uh, really feel taken care of. Uh, it's not the first time that we feature you on, your, uh, on our show, um, but the last time probably, I mean, it's, it's more than 10 years ago actually. So we have to rectify this um, and for this uh, I, I prepared maybe not the usual kind of questions, yeah, um, because we had, you know, all the regular stuff in the past. Um, we obviously can divert into the current album and uh, your activities, but let me start with a question um, that goes probably quite far back, maybe before the time uh, that that you uh, started Moonspell. Can you still remember the the point in your life when you thought um, it's it's absolutely urgent that you have to make music, that you have to start maybe as a singer or pick up an instrument, something like this? Um, well, um, I'm glad to be back on the show <laughs> on behalf of Moonspell. And uh, to answer your question, I think um, I have a slightly different que um, answer because um, I never thought of being a musician myself. I'm not a natural born singer. I don't have any natural born talent for music. I just have, I just make it up with a lot of, um, I like music, I love music. And especially in those days when we started off with Morbid God and then Moonspell back in between 89 and then 92 when we changed the name to Moonspell. The, the goal of having a band was very simple. Uh, we had a fanzine called Darkness Sin, and we were covering a lot of the extreme underground uh, back then, like Sarcophago, also bands like Paradise Lost, that at the time were a virtually unknown band in Portugal. And we got a lot of tapes from everywhere, Singapore, Brazil, etc. And we thought to ourselves, there is not a band in Portugal that plays this kind of music, this kind of dark metal, this kind of black metal, this kind of uh, extreme occult. So we made Morbid God and we made Moonspell, and that was the moment to be able to trade tapes uh, with our pan friends back then and sending th them a band that they would like more or recognize more than what the bands were in Portugal that were more emulating Metallica, Slayer uh, back then, yeah. Did you feel uh, did you feel somewhat isolated in in that role in in Portugal? For a few years, yeah. Uh, we even wrote Alma Mater for Mulfart. is a, a song that speaks about that isolation. It's not really a song about being patriotic or whatever, but it's a song about being in Portugal and our friends, our friends in the scene, other bands turning our back on us when we finally signed to Century Media, which we thought. Naively, it will be a good thing for the Portuguese scene. It was the foot at, at the door. But we felt uh, yeah, kind of misunderstood and alone in Portugal. But uh, fortunately, people abroad started to um, recognize us, and that brought us back to Portugal with a better status and people more noticing. I think in the beginning, uh, even people thought we were German or French or Brazilian. They didn't know in Portugal that we were Portugal because they couldn't believe there was a Portuguese band making wolf art. One of the biggest rumors about us in our little Portugal back then is that we didn't record or um, wrote the songs. And I mean, if you listen to wolf art properly, like we do, it's full of mistakes, <laughs> full of uh, things that are not perfect at all and typical from a young band. So that kind of proves our case. Things got way better and right now we are very established band in, in Portugal, but um, yeah, it took us a while to, you know, well, they say nobody's king in his own land, yeah, yeah. and that, that was really the truth in the beginning of Moonspell, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you make a strong point that with Wolfheart being so important, um, I mean, for me personally, the first thing that I heard was Under the Moonspell that you released right. on Edipo Kier, and uh, at the time, I thought, w what is this? I can't deal with that, yeah, it's because it's so different, yeah, um, I mean, the only other, let's say, music that went maybe in this direction with this kind of like a warm feeling but still being extreme underground metal came from from greece i would say yeah. right at the time so uh, this this for, to me came completely out of nowhere and i had to listen to it several times until i could make sense of it yeah because it was so different uh, thinking back of it now under the moon spell i mean what what's your feeling about it now well um i think you're completely right we were six people at the, the band back then was like a big hydra with six heads, and um, I just I just been with uh, Christian from Adiposer a couple of days ago in Lyon. We still get along 
uh, and um, he told us back then that we would make a, a mini CD because he couldn't afford to make an album. So we had uh, 21 minutes of music <laughs> and our, to, to bring it out on studio. And it was really hard to make sense of all the big confusion that was in our heads. And it was a um, love or hated thing for, for, the, for the fans. I was never happy with Under the Moon Spell. Uh, I think they, they, it had some moments and then we re-recorded in 2007 because I think our early stuff had good ideas but we didn't have the musicianship to go and, and, and back them. That was a big problem and also our path from Under the Moon Spell to Be Religious was always a path that we were trying to make our music more simple, more comprehensible and more homogenic. Not really because if the fans would understand it or not, because music is a question of taste, so some people absolutely love Under the Moon Spell, you know, some people absolutely hate it. Um, but um, with Wolf Arts, we had the Hydra effect still, with the folk, with the black metal, with the gothic, but also we had Valdemar's Orista to help us to make it more together. And then in Religious, we finally got rid of that problem, and it was an album just with songs, songs that last um, till the day. So yeah, it was a big um, messy mini LP to start with, but guess what? It really it was so in your cheek and so blandly extravagant that it caught the hero of Robert Kemp of Century Media that signed us in the moment with that with that album because he said this is probably so bad that I'm going to make something good. Uh, about this and um, yeah that, I mean that's way in the past but I remember the feeling even when I was very young to feel like well this is a bit of a, a salad some some like an occult salad with l too much ingredients too much flavor um, into it but some people really loved it and yeah. wanted us to do this for life but it was just a fir first record yeah first six yeah well I actually put it back on uh, in, in, into the player today to listen to it again and I mean I still love it and I know from, from you know, I know the time that it, fr from where it comes, right? I think that someone listen, listening to it today for the first time will not necessarily really appreciate that much. And I think, you know, it, it reeks of being over ambitious, you know, yeah. as a young band in, in a way, right? Uh, but but I, I really love it. Yeah. Anyway, so um, my next question would be, uh, do, you, do you still remember the first time that you stood on stage with, with the band and, and what was it like? Well, I do, yeah. I have a good memory for, this, uh, for these things. Um, we didn't want to play live, uh, first and foremost. Uh, we thought that, you know, coming back to the other question, I mean, we would play in Portugal, obviously, near Lisbon, our capital. And uh, we thought that um, those features of Moonspell, and we already under, uh, had under the Moonspell, was working on Wolf Art, uh, wouldn't translate into a stage. I think everybody will think we were a bunch of black metal clowns <laughs> going on stage. But uh, one of our old guitar players that played Nano Satanai, um, he was really keen in playing live. So he said, oh, already got all the equipment, all the venue. We sold 150 tickets. But then I remember one day before, I was fixing myself the equipment, <laughs> the PA and the lights. And it was a, a big, big mess. So we played it, we call it like a ritual, we try to make it very theatric, which is a feature we still get, got in Moonspell. And um, I remember there was like um, violins and the dancer and lots of stuff going on, like fire breathing, flowers, petals, baptism, everything very poetic and very symbolic. And then in the end, people were like trashing and, and going for it. We played... Um, like an outro with a poem of Alistair Crowley and I made like a the theatrical bow and everybody clapped and I never seen any band any band getting clapped at <laughs> as far as Portuguese things it was my throwing beers or calling names or you know those that context that people liked today so um, I felt like well this could be a good thing you know so we started playing more live uh, after um, um, that show more frequently and I think it was the playing life that actually uh, made us like a true band. You know, first time we played in Europe, supporting Wolf Arts, 
because it was not like Wolf Art is a big album these days, but uh, when we released it back in 95, it wasn't like everybody was running to the record store to buy it. You know, we still had to struggle for it and we still had to put up a fight on the road, many tours we did, and then people discovered Wolf Art and yeah, Moonspell. So when you started out, obviously you were still fairly young. Um, so what were your, your parents parents uh, thinking about the, the music that you were playing and how did they react to this? And in the end, and also the career choice, maybe? Well, like everything happened by accident. So obviously my parents wanted m something else for me. And they never believed I could uh, be a professional musician. But I don't blame them because I didn't believe in myself. Um, it happened just in 98 when we were already touring heavily and not having time to go study or work is that we decided hey we have no time to do anything else so let's try and pursue a professional uh, career so i mean there's all the anecdotes like cut your hair you know don't do that to your troth otherwise you'll get the cancer or something like that so it wasn't it wasn't easy but i know it was i, I don't i don't uh, blame them because um of course um especially the kind of music we did was something completely alien to Portugal. I mean, my mom and my dad didn't know about extreme metal bands or black metal bands from Singapore. They didn't know about Creator, they didn't know about Samuel, they didn't know about Celtic Frost. It was just not on their radar. For, for them, it was just a bunch of um, amalgam amalgamated noise that we were doing. And then, um, so they were not happy with it. But fast forward like 10 years or 15 years, When we got really big in Portugal, I had to have T-shirts, autograph cards, records that my mom was always asking for their friends, <laughs> you know. All right, all right. So it came out from absolute despise to um, even a sense of pride. Yeah. yeah. So, so if you if you look back, um, what what would you think was the most memorable mem memorable show that you ever played, and what was maybe the worst one in contrast? Well, the most memorable show for me was not even a big show. It was the first time we went to Oslo in Norway. It was at, um, a bit after the arrests, at the height of the black metal hate. And uh, we were touring with Morbid Angel. Uh, they ha were having Domination album. And also with um, Immortal, with ba Battles in the North, and we had Wolf Art. So nowadays it's a, it's a wet dream for an underground freak. But at, back then things were a bit different. And we heard, because there was no internet, that just one week before Paradise Lost had their um, tour bus vandalized. You know, they broke the windows. They sprayed it with, um, you know, those um, anti-mosh, anti-everything. So I was quite curious to go there and a little bit uh, afraid of what will happen to us because um, even though we were pen friends with everyone before, with Count Grishnak, with Bart Faust, with all the people behind that uh, movement, uh, they just changed a lot, you know. And we were getting death threats by letter in our PO box from many famous musicians now in Norway. Um, so um, we arrived there in our van, nothing happened, we went on stage, it was full, it was sold out and we played with heart and with pride and we got no applause at all, just blank black metal faces except for a couple of gothic girls that were doing all the party <laughs> over there with Vampiria and such. And I felt it was one of the most special moments for us because we could face adversity. It's easy when you go on stage and everybody um, is into you. But honestly, even though we had amazing responses, I, when I go on stage still tonight, I don't take anything from granted. And I think that was the, the click. So when we came back with Samuel and Rotten Christ, everything was very changed. We had a full house and we had already with the religious and we had people like jumping on the walls to see us and then we came back to type of negative and nowadays we have a very cool respect and fan bases in um, in Norway and I think one of the other most memorable shows uh, was that um, in the religious we did the release party at the Covenant in Lisbon and nobody believed it was going to sold out because it was a 3000 capacity and we sold it out and I couldn't believe it myself But um, in the end of the day, 
all people from the labels, everybody that was there drinking our beer, etc. We were stuck with the instruments, <laughs> and we had to take a ride from a friend. And that uh, kind of taught me what's the rock and roll business. So I'm not very keen to feel myself like a star or that I did stuff. Every day is a, every day is a struggle because it started like this, and it's the nature of the band. Yeah. Is there any ritual or any way how you prepare for going on stage before a gig? Um, well, nowadays more. Back then it was just like having a joint, <laughs> you know, getting a beer or a, a whiskey or whatever we could af afford and uh, go on stage, you know. It was very mindless. It was survival, actually, because um, the first tours we did, they were always on vans. And even when we moved on to tour buses and to tour with more people, I remember touring with Sam Allen. We had so much people in '96, I think. They had passage, and we had irreligious. And still, we didn't have enough to eat, or <laughs> we got ripped off. So um, nowadays, I just try to be practical because I'm 48. You know, I do this for since '95, almost non-stop, just with the with the COVID break. That's the only time I stopped touring for more than three months, probably, or playing shows. Uh, so I just, um, you know, uh, go do my warm-ups, try to be very, very calm. And when I go on stage, try to be possessed by whatever music we are going to play um, tonight and try to entertain. Because I think that's what people need these days of plague and war and politics and economics. That you get this from the moment you wake up to the moment you go to bed. You're always thinking about, are we going to pay your taxes? Are we going to pay your bills? So it's uh, for one hour or 70 minutes, especially for the Moonspell fans. Um, it's great that I'm on shape, that I don't have a big hangover. Nobody paid to see that. They paid to see the show. And uh, we are always very professional about this, yeah. Is there any uh, song that you would think is uh, particularly difficult for you to pull off in the live situation? Well, um, it really depends. Each case is a case. So um, first, it's hard to pick up a set with so many albums under our belt, you know. And um, there's not a particularly difficult song. But for instance, in uh, the um, Lisbon and Porto shows at the Coliseums that we're going to play for the 30 years, we are going to play some Under the Moon Spell, Under Satanai version songs. And those songs I sang when I was so young and had such a different voice. So those are challenging. Um, in terms of tone, in terms of speed, you know. But um, I think, to be honest, everything is challenging, but you have to approach it with caution and, and, and respect and never take anything for granted, never take any song for granted. Even Opium, which is an extremely easy song to, um, to sing, if I lose focus, then, then there we go. So for me, it's, it's a pleasure, but it's also a pain on stage because I'm always I'm relaxed I'm there to do my job and have my fun but I'm 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 there also representing a legacy that it's way above any musician on that stage because Moonspell is our band but in the end of the day it's um, people own the band at least for a while while they while they pay the ticket for it to watch it yeah so what's the best thing that that fans can do for you or for you for the band well To be honest, I mean, they do a lot of stuff, you know, they keep us alive, especially on the COVID times when we play these um, masked sit-down shows. I hated it, everybody hated it, but um, it was also an act of love by the fans to go there under those conditions and to watch a band. Of course, they needed it, they needed their fix, but imagine going, if, if we talk five years ago and say, oh, you're going to see a show of your favorite band, but you have to wear a mask. And, be, uh, and being sitting down, people were like, I will never do that. And then they adapted. But for me personally, I think the best thing is when, when people come to me and say not only that our music can help them through uh, sad and happy moments, but also when they say, I read this book because I read that you wrote the lyric about this book. I think that's a really cool thing with metal. And I always had that with metal, listening to Celtic Frost, discovering Baudelaire, listening to Maiden, discovering Coldridge. I mean, it's a kind of um, tradition, and I kind of like that uh, when they say they learn something 
from us, not only from the music, the enjoyment, but they found out a, a book or some, something that was helpful in their own formation, yeah. yeah. There might also be a downside in playing in a maybe a popular band. So is there anything that is annoying that, you know, let's, certain fans would do to the band or that uh, how they might approach you? Well, I have no problems with the fans as long as um, they know how to behave socially. Sometimes people just have no manners and they push you really hard. And it's a shame because, um, you know, it, it creates a very strange situation because you feel used, you feel abused, and then the fan thinks she or he didn't get what he paid for, you know. And I think that um, nowadays it's very common with the social networking, you know, it's, it's a quick trigger, people offend very much, like, I hate your music, or I love your music, it's, there's not a middle term there, you know, it's everything very extreme. Um, these days, but um, I believe that for me, the worst thing a fan can do is to make a situation about him or her, you know, because the music is a community, and even though I'm performing, performing for each one of them or talking off stage with one of them, I think that we all need uh, respect and we all need to be civilized, and sometimes things just get out of hand. Like people saying, come on, sit with us. Uh, and then I don't feel like, and, oh, you're a boss or you're an asshole. I said, yeah, no, I'm just a guy you know, that wanted, doesn't want to sit with us. If I wasn't uh, the Moonspell singer, it wouldn't be a big deal for you. And worse things, of course. Yeah, yeah, sure. All right, let's switch gears a little bit. As a fan or as a, as a musician, did you ever get in trouble with, with uh, security at any show? <laughs> Were you ever beaten up by security? Not beaten up, but fortunately, I didn't have that um, misfortune. But, um, you know, sometimes, especially in Portugal, when people have small powers, they just uh, go abuse. So I've been kicked out of my own shows, <laughs> you know, uh, barred at the door. Uh, like, even as a guest, uh, one of the last times Iron Maiden came to Portugal in the arena, I had a VIP <laughs> pass. And uh, I didn't want to bother the band, but we had a friend there that was expecting us just to have a beer and to say hi to Bruce Dickinson, but we got kicked out um, anyway. And I didn't want to make a trouble. I said, just, um, you know, you know that last drink you have and it's the drink too much. Then you go home and the night is, wasn't as good. Sometimes I face those moments like this. I, I just go. I already saw the show. That was the most um, important. I respect a lot of the work of the security, but sometimes, yeah, especially in some countries, I mean, that we play South America. I remember first time we played in Medellin, I put my feet, my foot actually, on top of a monitor, which is something everybody does, and they immediately took the monitors away, <laughs> leaving me without sound. I was like, all right, and I had to play the whole show, otherwise that I could probably get killed, yeah. <laughs> Uh, guys, t if you're listening to this, take note. Yeah. Um, so if, if yeah, if if you were to change uh, or to to swap roles in the band on stage, what instrument would you pick to play, rather than being the frontman and singer? Definitely the drums. But I'm. Well, why, why is that? Because for me, drum, drums are the the spinal cord of uh, heavy metal. You know, like a bad drummer or a night gone wrong with drummer, it's not um, it's not the same. And I think it's just it's, uh, it's the instrument. Um, it's totally the opposite of vocals because uh, in vocals you can uh, you can be a poet, you can uh, be romantic. You know, you don't need to have a special talent for it, and you can get away get away with it like I did. But with drums, you really have to be especially talented and committed. And while the vocals are an, an, an instrument from the inside, drums are for the outside. So I would like to try that. But um, honestly, when we formed Morbid Goth, I was supposed to be the drummer. But I had no coordination, no money to buy a drum kit. So I kind of I was into books and writing and vocal and well shouting and whatever whatever. And uh, so I became the the singer, but it wasn't planned. Yeah. So I I will, I will definitely be the drummer. Yeah. Yeah. All right. All right. So say w w once the show is over and you and you get off stage, so so, so w w what happens then? You know, are you still full of adrenaline? W w what's the next move that you that you're doing typically after a show? Well, um, it really depends. You know, I think the most important is not to have plans. 
obviously nowadays it's the third year of our career so there's way less party than what it used to be but there was times when we were just like wolfing around you know just chasing girls doing drugs uh, uh, drinking whatever we could but um, I think those times um, are a bit over because those times go away with your resistance with your, with your body resistance so nowadays we can come here to the bus I can DJ a little bit I mean I'm not going to play extreme metal but I'm going to play like uh, pleasing songs you know like the other day we had a cool night with 80s hits like Don Ellie and stuff like that and um, and just keep it quiet because um, normally on tour as this kind of tour have no days off etc everything traveling you know performing talking meeting doing all the all the stuff so sometimes yeah, I have adrenaline and I want to go for a especially in Portugal we just go out with, for a drink with friends but when it's on tour it's just normally depends on the day it can happen otherwise but normally the routine is just to chill down chill out you know um, have a good whiskey 12 years old or 18 <laughs> preferably uh, talk with some friends have uh, something to bite and just get ready for the for the next day I remember when we started touring there was no Netflix there was no internet and people had each other which was very cool because we were always talking and you know listening to music and nowadays it's a bit different yeah we are more individualists these, these days and that reflects on the touring behavior still, yeah. But there's there's nights to remember still, yeah. <laughs> Not to forget. <laughs> I mean, now that you're ex <clears throat> explaining this and yeah, talking about you know maybe the wild nights that you had maybe in the past. Um, I mean, we are actually the same age, and when I think back now across all these years and having met many musicians, I also noticed that that's you know quite a few of them never made this transition you know they they kind of like got caught in this drugs and alcohol thing and you saw them deteriorating over the years at to a point where i said okay they, they probably won't make it much much longer and in the end it, it it turned out to be true right yeah i mean do you have the same impression that because you know alcohol is always available in a way right i'm i'm, I'm drinking a beer now yeah i'm <laughs> i'm not innocent at all but uh i don't know like i, I it, it got me thinking like a couple of weeks ago that uh yeah, but i never really reflected on it so much well, uh, I did. I mean, when I grew up in uh, in the eighties in Portugal, we had a big heroin problem. Uh, my neighbors, a lot of people died. It was very heavy in Portugal, so I kind of was brought up in a situation where I got to witness that deterioration on a daily basis. You know, not only from the people, you know, they addicted themselves, but also from the families, the neighborhood, etc. So one thing that we always been very keen in Moonspell is that, yeah, we, 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 we had our nights, we made our stuff, we tried a little bit of everything, but we never depended on it. The, 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 the problem is um, the way that the drugs, for instance, or the alcohol takes over you. So depending, dependence was not something we to totally wrote off our vocabulary and we were very keen on it. And also the way that we feel the band is. We never thought that the band is ours to manipulate. Maybe musically, we are we are free to do whatever we want, and we exploited that freedom to a large extent. But um, I hate, uh, you know, to see even friends of mine that are like almost pulled by strings to go on stage, or that they skip shows, or that um, is disrespectful for everybody, for themselves, for their crowds, because if someone comes here in Stuttgart, he or she doesn't care or doesn't have to care or doesn't know that yesterday I was drinking a bottle of absinthe in my bunk and today I can perform I think everybody has their meltdowns their breakdowns and I think that's human so um, can happen to everybody but um, when you do it consciously that you're having a Jack Daniels bottle every night people have to know there is consequence and the price and the price is that you kill something you like for something that you depend on. So you really have to have your priorities straight. And I think Munspel always had them. Yeah. So uh, s sitting on the tour bus here now, now that you're saying you know, like you have your bunk as a private space, um, I, I, do you have any any rules that you have to follow here, or how how do you define them to to, to get along? Well, uh, those are unwritten rules, obviously. Especially this tour bus has twenty. 
24 people maybe, I don't know, 20, 22. <laughs> uh, so, um, of course, that if you want to get through the end of the tour, you, ha you cannot trash it or you cannot scream or whatever. Sometimes it's, it's cool, we have, we have a nice atmosphere, people are very civilized. But I think the most famous rules of tour bus life is um, not to do number two in the toilet and to sleep with your um, feet in the direction of the, of the marching bus because if you turn yourself like opposite, you can crush your neck on, a, on a extreme braking. And that I learned since uh, since the that's that's nowadays they don't need to tell me but uh, yeah when we started touring ah oh, it's, it's it's better for me to sleep with my neck to the marching direction said well it's better if you don't do that because yeah. if the tour bus breaks you'll break your neck too so yeah. that's not very pleasant <laughs> did you ever get uh, sick on tour and how do you deal with such a situation well yeah many times. Uh, that situation just have to i've been in the hospital i've been in the dentist a lot of people have been you know but um that's the kind of situation that um the show must go on sometimes you don't go 100 percent to the stage but then you just uh, fix it so normally what i do is that i bring my drugs legal drugs <laughs> from uh, from portugal drink a lot of water and try to stay healthy and know your limitations i think um when the bell rings, you say, okay, you're out in the cold or you're out drinking too much. It's time to recoil. It's better to listen to that voice. But I've been uh, sick many times on, on tours, especially what we call the tour cold, <laughs> which is not COVID, but it's something that you just get from breathing the air of many people, you know, or someone coughs and this is all AC and you get it. I got the red eye, the pink eye, actually. I don't know. I got a uh, pull like three or four um, tooth on tour which was not very because I couldn't use all the the um, Novocaine you know all the anesthesia because I had to sing at night so I mean I don't want to say it's the hardest life but it's also not the easiest it's like the circus you know sometimes and the show must go on yeah is the hearing still okay the hearing is perfect yeah the hearing um, I made a test and uh, even though now with the in-ears there's a lot of stress so I have the normal loss of hearing for a man of my age not because i'm exposed to extreme music or loud stuff it's just uh, normal i have a um, still good hearing yeah. yeah okay so you won't need to hear listen to me or hear me much longer because we're slowly getting to the end of it um so f for young bands starting out these days what would be your advice Oh, I'm terrible at advising because um, Moonspell career is not a planned career. So I think that sometimes I should be the one taking advice from the young bands because um, they know everything. But I think uh, the advice I give to them is no, do not think you know everything because um, and don't rely, don't put all your eggs on the basket. And nowadays all these eggs are in the digital virtual basket. There's still some old school things some um, manners of business of singing of being on stage um, that are still very valid and still very um, authentic um, I dread the thought when my label asked him do you have a TikTok account I said no <laughs> can you get one I said no <laughs> but you could s get more reach but I don't want more reach because I don't know what to do on the, um, and those things make me nervous um, the other day I agreed to do an Instagram takeover which sounds really scary and uh, for Napalm Records and I'm already thinking about but what do I have interesting for people to tune in and see me walking in the streets of Munich I don't know so sometimes I feel this is very unreal but I also know that that the dream of you know being an artist or entertainer and having your crowds there's something in the 80s in the 90s there was a different relationship nowadays People want you to be somewhere, not to see you. Like on Instagram, they say, "Oh, it's gonna be, you're gonna do this. I'm going to be there, just hanging out virtually, and then nobody shows up." You know. So I think that um, younger bands should also take care of the human touch uh, with the fans and with the people they work with, and with themselves, obviously. Yeah, yeah probably that's part of the answer to the next question the pre-final one actually uh, which is because you know we, we talked about you know annoying things that fans can do trouble with security 
my next question would have been, you know, what pisses you off when it comes to media representatives, press, radio, or whatever, you know, is there anything <laughs> that you just don't like, or? I mean, once I was on uh, Century Media office doing like eight hours phone hours per day, and um, some people were just uh, wasting my time, like, how many people work at the Century Media building? I have no idea, I'm here to talk about music. But honestly, I don't see the press as uh, an enemy. I see us um, as rowing to the same direction. You know, radio. I mean, to have radio that still plays metal, you know, it's something so rare these days. We have like a couple of shows in local radios, one show in national um, um, radio. But we always find metal has always been a very independent kind of music, independent spirit and a kind of culture too. So, I mean, I never... In Portugal, sometimes I fell off with uh, with some journalists because they can be very offensive over there, uh, especially you know denying our merit as a metal band because we do well internationally, and they say, "Oh no, it's just metal, so it doesn't matter." So I, I had my fights um, over it, but um, I stopped fighting against it. Uh, I stopped being um, shocked or surprised by by the media because, um, in a way, we all struggle to be relevant still. You know, even metal media these days, because people know everything. People go online and they can check out whatever they want. So they do not depend on the bands or even on the press to do that. So I kind of see ourselves more as allies than than foes. So I, I never walked out of an interview, even though I had something very strange once uh, in Poland. There was a guy that had a radio. I don't know if it was legit or not, but he went backstage you know with accreditation and his radio was called Radio Macaque and then after a very bizarre interview that I want to like to end as soon as possible he puts his chest naked and he had like a nipple tattoo see Radio Macaque and he wanted me to bite it or whatever And I said, well, that's the end of the interview, folks. So just escort Radio Macaque <laughs> to, the, um, to the door. And sometimes it's just, um, f hey, it's a crazy life. Once it wasn't really a press representative, but I had um, a small interview. I'm not a huge fan, but of course I respect it for the Ramones Museum and Collector in Finland. And this guy is very strange because um and i warn every musician because he has uh, f big fingernails and after the interviews just like picked me picked at me with his big fingernails and he does this to every musician he interviews yeah we suffer a lot you have no idea guys <laughs> <laughs> that's the weirdest thing that i ever ever heard that's kind of like some i don't know what is that like some hillbilly acupuncture or something yeah <laughs> Madness, madness, I think. It's just full moon madness. Yeah. <laughs> uh, le le let's end it. End this then with something uh, sen more sensible. Um, so the show is called What's Metal? Yeah, w what, what is metal? Do you have a description for that? For me, metal is culture. Metal is, um, you listen to Metallica, Ride the Lightning, and you listen to For Whom the Bell Tolls, and you go read Hemingway. Or you listen to Rime of the Ancient Mariner, by Maiden and Coleridge, the poet, and you buy the book and you read it, or you listen to, like I did back in the day, to Into the Pandemonium by Celtic or Celtic Frost, I don't know, I think they say Celtic. Um, they hate to be asked this question, by the way. Uh, and uh, you go and, and read Baudelaire. So for me, metal is definitely, of course it's a brotherhood, it's a lifestyle, it's a kind of music, but for me, particularly, it's above all a culture, yeah.